about the last six weeks we've been in a series that uh, called Dumb Things Smart Christians Believe. And the, you know, the premise is that there are a number of there are a number of things that some, you know, very smart Christians have come to believe and, and find is true, even though they're not biblical. Okay. And so <clears throat> Yeah, there's it, it, when they do, there's a variety of outcomes that happen. Most of the time, though, the result is that, that when we believe these things as truth, they end up having an impact on our walk of faith. They, they end up impacting our relationship with Jesus. And so I, you know, I wanted to kind of do this series for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is because if, you know, if anybody's sitting here today, or if you're watching online and you have kind of you know, fallen into believing one of these things, uh, I would like you to be able to, to see where it is that it is wrong, give you a biblical background for it. Uh, if Now, maybe if you're not one where you, you know, believe it is true, I also want you, when you hear these things, to be able to stand up from a biblical standpoint uh, and speak about them so that others don't fall into believing that they are true. And so I think it's one of the, one of the big reasons. And I, so we're going to start off today with a word. Uh, this is a word that elicits a lot of responses uh, from, from many of us. Uh, the word is forgiveness. Now, I know when I say the word forgiveness, for some of us, oh my goodness, this is a, it's a wonderful feeling. It, it brings such joy. For others, I say the word forgiveness and, and you experience anger. You know, for some of us, when we hear the word forgiveness, it just kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're washed over with, with feelings of, of relief. For others of us, we hear the word forgiveness and it brings up feelings of dread. Uh, anger, frustration. And so I think it's no stretch to say that the word forgiveness is a word, and the whole principle of forgiving is, uh, is something that moves all of us in different ways, okay? Uh, so today we're going we're gonna to start, I, I do want to get this out of the way right up front. Uh, no matter what emotions the word forgiveness bubbles up in you, if you are here today as a believer, it's not optional. Okay? I cannot say that any clearer. If you are here today as a Christian, the, the choice of whether or not to forgive for you is not optional. We are commanded as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Christ, that we are to forgive. And you don't have to look any further uh, Matthew chapter 18, you start in verse 15. Jesus is teaching his disciples uh, of, of how to forgive, of this, this process that we go through. And then in, in verse 21, Peter comes up, you know, and, and Peter says first off, and he's like, okay, okay, so, so how many times am I supposed to forgive? Seven? You know, and, uh, and Jesus says, no, no, no. It depends on your translation because Jesus says, no, 77 times or 70 times 7, which would be 490 times. Uh, either way, that's a lot of forgiving, okay? But the number is not the point, okay? The, the point here is the fact that we are to forgive. The, the point is that forgiveness for the Christian should be unlimited. Okay? Uh, forgiveness, I, I, forgiveness is the foundational message of the Christian faith. Because forgiveness is love in action. Forgiveness is love in action. Uh, with that being said, I also understand it ain't easy. It, it is love in action, but it is not easy. I get that. Uh, forgiving is difficult. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. We wouldn't be having this message. Okay, It wouldn't even be a problem. Uh, but the fact is that it's not easy. Uh, it, forgiveness is one of those. It is a difficult, difficult thing. I think one of the reasons, though, that, 
maybe it, it's even harder sometimes for us to forgive is because of the fact that, that it's been kind of exacerbated by the fact a lot of us don't understand. We've never really seen what biblical forgiveness is. We've never come to understand what biblical forgiveness is. And, you know, society and, and even the church, they've come up with kind of some really silly ideas about what forgiveness is. Uh, some of them are just a little strange. Some of them are downright dangerous. And so that's what I, I do. I want to take a few minutes and kind of talk about some of the things that, that forgiveness is not. Sorry, I got new glasses this week. And uh, so they're good. But I'm trying to find my spot. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's when, I, when, I first went to, when I first went to bifocals, I, I was told by, by the eye doctor, he said, well, you're going to be very agreeable. And I didn't understand what he meant until I realized that's because I'm always looking for where you're clear. <laughs> okay? So, uh, so if I look confused, I'm, re I'm really not looking for agreement. It's not like, I've, you know, forgiveness, yeah, I don't need you to nod along, okay? Unless you want to. Uh, no, let's talk a little bit about what forgiveness is not. Uh, it's, I really would like to start a little bit about what forgiveness uh, is not. Uh, and these are some of the common beliefs that are out there. Number one, forgiveness is not believing. It's not saying that nothing happened. Okay, forgiveness is not uh, minimizing the impact you know, so that we can forgive it. That is, uh, that's not the case. Forgiveness is not about, you know, just ignoring that anything happened. Forgiveness is not about minimizing the impact. Let's be honest, if, if that were the case, if it's really no big deal, if we can pretend it didn't happen, then why do we need to forgive it? Okay. If it's really no big deal, then, then there's no forgiveness that is needed. Uh, so that, that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is also, forgiveness is not a never-ending series of second chances, okay? I'd say if you choose to offer forgiveness, that does not make you a doormat, okay? It does not make you a doormat, common to, common to, contrary to common belief. Uh, next, forgiveness is not a fresh start with all of the consequences and the old baggage removed. That is not what forgiveness is. And we're going to kind of come back to that a little bit later when we talk about what it is. Uh, and then also, forgiveness does not mean that there is an immediate uh, or full restoration of the relationship and trust. That is not what forgiveness is. And once again, it's another one that we're going to kind of come back to uh, a little bit later, okay? But I think maybe the one that gets us in, in the most trouble is this idea that somehow forgiving means forgetting, okay? Forgiveness is not forgetting. Uh, and, you know, we sometimes wonder, it seems like we, we've been get taught that we are supposed to forgive and forgiveness wipes the slate so clean that even the memory of the offense disappears. If we truly forgive, we don't even remember it. And you kind of wonder sometimes, like, where do we get this idea? You know, where did this come from? This, this belief comes out of the Bible. You didn't expect that one, did you? I want to read a couple of uh, verses and, and then kind of lay it. One of them is on the front of your, of your bulletin. Hebrews 8, verse 12 actually quotes Jeremiah 31, 34. The Lord declares, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Uh, another one, Psalm 103, verse 12, says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Romans 4, verses 7 and 8. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Micah 7.19 says, You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. And so we read passages like this and they, along with others, give us the impression that what? That God forgives and then forgets our sins. Okay, and then we, then we turn around, we read Matthew chapter 6, we end up in verse 14, and it says, For if you also, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And we're taught that we are to do what? To forgive 
as God forgives. And so all of a sudden we find ourselves uh, in this quandary to, you know, to say if it's biblical that God forgives and then forgets our sins and we are to forgive as God forgives, then we're supposed to forgive and forget, right? Wrong. And here's the first thing. Here's the first reason that that is wrong. We have talked about this many, many times. We've talked about the attributes of God. We know that God is omniscient. Omniscient means that God knows all things, correct? All-knowing. In other words, God doesn't forget anything. There is nothing that he does not know. So when we say that God forgives and then forgets our sins, what are we really talking about? What we're, what we're saying is that he no longer holds them against us, uh, if we go through, I, I think here's, to say that God does not remember our sins means that God no longer responds to us in light of our sins. He no longer responds to us in light of our sins. Romans 4 it says that he no longer counts them against us. In other words, our sins no longer derail our relationship with him. That is what it means when it says that God does not remember our sins. Uh, in, in fact, if you think about this, the Bible that is sitting on your lap, okay, was, was inspired by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and in it, it contains chronicles of the sins of many men and women of the Bible, okay? Uh, Peter, Samson, David, I mean, all listed there for us to learn from. So to say that God forgets would be wrong because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Bible to record it so that we could look at it today. God does not forgive. He simply does not hold them against us. He no longer sees us. Okay, in relation to our sin, and I, and there's a there's a great example. I, you know, one of the we go back Second Samuel, uh, one of the great stories of of forgiveness. Okay, uh, is chronicled there. It's we've talked about it many times. David and Bathsheba, and their their I mean, lying, adulterous, murderous scandal. Okay. Uh, the thing we know is that as we read the story, Nathan comes to, the prophet Nathan comes to David, and, and when he confronts David, okay, and he says, you're the man. What David does is David owns it. He doesn't bow up. He doesn't make excuses, okay? He doesn't rationalize. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't pretend it didn't happen. He doesn't try to you know, say, well, it was really not that big of a deal. He, in other words, he doesn't do what we do, right? You know what we do? Well, it was really, I mean. That's what we do. We rationalize. We excuse it. We explain it away. We pretend it wasn't a big deal. David did absolutely none of that. He owned it. Uh, he owned it, and the first thing he said is, I have sinned against God. Okay? Yes, he killed Uriah. He had cheated with, with his wife, but the thing is he knew that he had sinned against God. That was step one. But, but I love then that uh, in 2 Samuel 12, 13, Nathan tells him, he says, The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. And then suddenly the, the sun came out and the clouds kind of parted and, and there was a rainbow that came down and, and everybody lived happily ever after. No? Actually, uh, David, there, there were a lot of consequences of his actions. Because of his choices, he had to deal with those but I think the one thing is to understand what God didn't do. I mean, there, there were consequences, but what God didn't do is he did not doom David to a life of hopelessness and regret, okay? What he actually did was he gave him the opportunity to be something more than a lying, adulterous murderer. He gave him the opportunity to be a man after God's own heart. Consider this. 
many of David's writings, many of them that are some of our most beloved, happened after this event. After Nathan had said, you're the man. After his son had died. And those writings, those writings, think about this. They are, they are recorded by God, recorded in, in the scriptures, quoted by Jesus for what purpose? To encourage and to comfort us. I mean, talk about restoration that here is David who went through all of this, who did all of this. God has forgiven his sins. He no longer looks at him in the light of his sins, and he uses him to write passages that you and I turn to today when we're in dark times, when we're in bad times. That's exactly what he did. Talk about restoration. I mean, that amazing. And so what we learn in this passage is not that there won't be consequences. It's not that God forgets our sins when he forgives them, but instead that he no longer responds to us in light of those sins when he forgives them. Now, why does this matter to us? You know, what difference does it make? Because we're sitting here talking about, you know, forgiveness and, and yeah, we're talking about forgiveness of God. But let's be honest, where we're getting to is the nuts and bolts of it. And that is how you and I forgive. Right. So what does that have to do with us? OK. <clears throat> Excuse me. We need to learn to be forgiving and first and foremost i think we need to make uh, we need to understand that if we make forgetting a part of forgiving we will fail at it say it again if you think that forgiving someone requires that you forget it you will fail at it because we are not omniscient but you know what we don't forget we don't and the fact is, the harder you try to forget something, the more you remember it. I mean, the, the harder you try, the harder it gets. And, I, and the thing is that, that here's what kind of happens. It, I, to me, the, this concept forgive and forget, I want to give you a visual. Imagine a piece of rusted metal, okay, rusty metal, spray paint it. Oh, it is shiny, it is smooth, it looks great, doesn't it? the rust always comes back and when the rust comes bubbling through the surface it's uglier and it's worse than it was before and it is the same way when it comes to you and I thinking that we need to be able to forgive and forget because we we say we've got to do that and what happens is it comes bubbling back to the surface and when it does it brings more baggage and and anger and frustration we get th with it it brings more issues with it we, I, there's a couple of things that happen. Number one, we usually get angry. We get angry at ourselves, okay, because we can't do it, because we failed at it. Then we get angry at others, and we get angry at others. Why? Because if I can't move past it, you shouldn't be able to either. And then we get angry at God. Why? Because we tried what he told us to do, and it didn't work. That's why this is so, so dangerous. So here's the, here's the thing I think we want to remember, a couple of things. Number one, please understand forgiveness is a process. It is a process. Uh, and I know that's tough for society because we, we are the people, I don't know about you, we, we stand in front of the microwave and tap our foot with impatience, okay? And so the whole concept of something that, that requires a process that may take time uh, just goes all over us. Uh, we, we don't like it, okay? Uh, and so, you know, it, the fact is that forgiveness is a process. For some of us, it's a daily process. For some of us, it is a, it may be a lifelong process. There are things that we'll have to go through years and decades before we ever get to a point that we truly feel like we have uh, forgiven them. But as I said in the beginning, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, wouldn't they? We wouldn't be having this discussion. But the alternative, the alternative to forgiveness is to allow it to eat you alive. Okay, Nelson Mandela said unforgiveness is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Unforgiveness 
It's like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. You know, it, it won't. The only person it kills is you. It will. It'll, it'll eat you alive. And it, and it takes the form of high blood pressure and ulcers and, and failed relationships and addictions and depression and, and even suicide. The fact is that, that when we refuse to forgive, it will it'll eat us alive. Uh, I know God tells us to forgive because, you know, because he forgives. We are told to forgive because forgiveness is love in action. I honestly believe that God tells us to forgive as well because he knows what will happen to us if we don't. He knows what it does to us when we don't. And, and God only wants for you what you would want for yourself if you were smart enough to figure it out. He only wants for you what you would want for yourself if you knew everything that he knows. He only wants for you what you would want for yourself if you knew everything that he knows. So, what is forgiveness? I told you what it isn't. What is it? Where do we go from here? I, I want to give you a couple of things here. Number one, genuine forgiveness is giving up any expectation of repayment. Okay, genuine forgiveness is giving up any expectation of uh, of re the right to retaliate. And, you know, we've talked about this before. I, the thing is that forgiveness and, and being offended in whatever way, it's I think one of the easiest ways to see it is it is a debt debtor relationship. It's exactly what it is. Okay, it is the reason that when when we if you hurt somebody, okay, you do something. What do you say? I owe you an apology because you understand I'm indebted to you now. It's the reason we say I need to make it up to them. Or we say that people owe us something. And, and that is that when we understand that debt, debt or relationship, when it comes to forgiveness, we realize that the genuine forgiveness is me giving up the expectation of getting anything from you. Okay, I don't need anything anymore. That's the first step in, in genuine forgiveness. And I, you know, I said in the beginning that it was... Forgiveness is love in action, okay? That it is the, it's the foundational message of the Christian life. And maybe that is why I think about this. In 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, what do we read about love? We know that love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil. Forgiveness is love in action, okay? That's exactly what it is, and, and that's why, you know, we, when you say, when you are begin to forgive someone and you say, I no longer expect anything from you, okay? You don't have to say you're sorry. Now, I get it. It's nice to hear somebody say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you, but you don't need to hear it, and, and I will and I'll say it's on the other side. If you are here today as a Christian, your first move should be to go and ask for forgiveness. Okay? If there is someone that you have offended, you should have that conviction. But the fact is that, that whenever you and I forgive, what you're, what you're saying, okay, is I'm putting this behind me. I'm putting this behind me, and I don't, I don't need you to say you're sorry. I don't need you to, to give me anything. I'm not going to secretly hope that bad things happen to you so that I feel better about myself. I'm moving on. I'm leaving this behind me, and I don't need anything to move forward. That, that's what genuine forgiveness is. I, to me, genuine forgiveness is seeing it as God does, and that is that you don't have to forget what happened, but you no longer look upon that person and see that sin you no longer see them in light of that offense that issue that situation whatever it is secondly genuine forgiveness is taking action towards restoration and i know this is not exciting news i'm i know it not at all okay uh, but when we forgive the first step should be towards restoration if possible Okay. Now, it is not always possible. 
I mean, I, I will be the first to admit that it is not always possible to restore the relationship. Romans uh, 12, 18, one of my favorites says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Okay, the reason it says, as far as it depends on you, is because there are some people you can't live at peace with. There are some people that you can't go to that next. There is no restoration. But that should always be our first step. When we make the decision to forgive and we say, I no longer need anything from you for what you said about me. I no longer need anything from you for what you did to me. And then you begin to work to restore that relationship. Now, if they don't change, there's nothing you can do about that. Okay, if you have a person that they just absolutely, they will not change, they will not be different, there is no remorse, well, no, you can't have a relationship with them. You can't restore a relationship with them. And that's the reason it says that if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone because that's, that's what genuine forgiveness is. Because you, the only thing you have any control over is what? Me. Okay? That's the only thing that you and I have any control over. Us. And how we respond and handle things. And so that actually goes right into, I think it goes hand in hand with the next one. Genuine forgiveness is unconditional. When you say, I will forgive you if. When you say, if they will, then I will forgive. That's not. That's not forgiveness. That's called negotiation. Genuine forgiveness is unconditional. Now, I, I will say this. Because this is where everybody, well, but, and he, they, okay. Genuine forgiveness is unconditional. Trust is not. Okay. And this goes back to the, you know, restoring the, of the the relationship and everything else forgiveness can never be earned trust must be okay if if someone if someone steals from me the bible says that i am to forgive them but nowhere in the bible does it say that i have to give them a key to the house well i'm serious and that but we, we tend to, somewhere we've warped this and we're like, oh, I forgive you, so now we got to be the best of friends ever and i got to trust you. No. I forgive you. That, that, that's a hard issue. That is the fact that I no longer need anything from you for what you did to me. But you're going to have to earn my trust. You're, you're going to have to, if, if this relationship's going to be restored, there are some conditions to that. Okay? If... If someone hurts you, you forgive them, but that doesn't mean that you have to put yourself right in that position to allow them to hurt you in the same way again. Okay? So while, while forgiveness is unconditional, trust is conditional. Um, and I, when Jesus hung on the cross, he didn't say, Father, if they ask for it, will you forgive them? Did he? Praise the Lord, he did not. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Unconditionally. I, the, the one thing you need to remember, forgiveness is not about them. It's all about you. And I say that because I know some of you, you've been hurt by somebody maybe that has died. Uh... You've been hurt by somebody that maybe you have absolutely no idea where they are. You know, I mean, they're, they just kind of disappeared. There's no way to make contact with them. Uh, some of you, you have been hurt by people that have no idea that they caused you any harm. Some of you have been hurt by people that know exactly what they did to you and they will never, ever experience remorse for it in their life. Okay? And, and here's the deal, though, that is if, if forgiveness is about them, you will never be able to forgive and to move past that. Okay? Forgiveness is about us. It is about our heart. Um, 
at its core, like I said, forgiveness is, it, it's about that giving up any expectation of repayment, of restitution, of retaliation. It is saying to that person, whether you say it in person or whether you just say it mentally, you sit down and you say it to a chair, whatever it is, I, I don't care whatever your process is, but it's saying that with God's help, I am not going to let you, I'm not going to let what you did, I'm not going to let what you said, I'm not going to let that situation control me any longer. I'm moving forward. That, that's, what, that's what genuine forgiveness is. And that only happens when we understand that genuine forgiveness is letting God be God. Genuine forgiveness is letting God be God. As followers of Jesus, we battle hatred with love. We, we fight anger with compassion. We let God exact justice where it is needed, and we let him bring reconciliation where it is possible. But genuine forgiveness trusts God to be God, knowing that his ways are higher than our ways, knowing that his thoughts are are higher than our thoughts, and knowing that no matter what, what God wants for me is what I would want for myself if I was smart enough to figure it out. Genuine forgiveness requires us letting God be God. And genuine forgiveness, I, I said it in the beginning, I'll say it again, it's a process. Genuine forgiveness is hard, and I know that. I really do. Uh, but it's worth it. It is worth it physically. Is it, it is worth it emotionally. But most of all, it is worth it spiritually. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Corey Ten Boom wrote, she was having a, a hard time forgiving something that had happened to her. And she would try and she would try and and she just never could you know, forgive it. It just seemed like it would keep her awake at night all the time. She was always thinking about it and it would just it just kept her awake night after night after night. And she says that she she got to a point where she just cried out uh, to God and, and she was saying, you know, that I'm I'm trying to forgive. I need help. Send me help to forgive them. And she said that that help showed up in the person of a kindly Lutheran pastor. And, and she, she poured out her heart to this man about how she was trying to forgive, but she could not, and she had not slept in two weeks because of just the way that it laid upon her. And, and she said that this, this pastor, he kind of nodded out the window and there was a church tower. And he said, in that tower, there is a bell. It's an old bell and it rings and it is rung by, by pulling on the rope. And he said, but when the sexton lets go of the rope, the bell continues to ring. Ding, dong. He said, it's the same way with forgiveness. He says, when we have been pulling on the rope, for a long time in our grievances and ringing the bell and ringing the bell. When we finally let go, the bell continues to ring. Ding, dong, ding, dong. But over time, it begins to slow down. Over time, the rings are not as loud and they are not as forceful. And at what point... There's the last dong, and it's silent. It's the same way when it comes to forgiveness. When we quit accepting, you know, expecting repayment. When we understand that our forgiveness is unconditional. When we understand that forgiveness requires us to let God be God and to trust in the process. We don't grab the rope again. One day we find that that person that we just could never ever forgive, we hear their name in the grocery store, we see them somewhere, and those old feelings of uh, anger don't bubble up. 
we, we hear something that reminds us of that situation that we went through where that person hurt us, where that person did this, where that person said this. And we find that suddenly we're able to, to speak to someone about that time in our life and bring comfort and encourage to, to them out of what happened to us rather than suddenly curling up into a ball in, in anger and depression and frustration that that still haunts us. That's how forgiveness works. And I can't say it any clearer. If you are sitting here today and you say that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're sitting here today and you say, I am a Christian, it is not optional for you to forgive. You don't get to decide, I will forgive, but oh, not them. You can't say, I can forgive this, but not that. We can't do it. Because Jesus didn't say the same thing about your sins. And I guarantee you, I've got enough in my pile of crud that he could pick out. You know, I'm good with that one, but whoo! Praise God he did. It is not easy. I know that. And I'm not sitting here asking anybody to say, you just need to make this blank. And, oh, I forgive and it'll be great. I know that when we choose to forgive, it is going to wear on us. It is going to, to take time. But here's the deal. If we don't, it'll eat us alive. It will destroy our lives. It will destroy our health. And it will destroy our witness. And so as we come to our time of decision, I'm going to ask you to stand. And I really, I, I want to have a time of prayer, but I want you guys, to, I want you to answer two questions. Two questions, and, and then I want you to respond to them. The first question is, who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to forgive today? The second question who do I need to ask for their forgiveness? And it may be a person. It may be Jesus himself. Who do I need to ask for forgiveness from today? Would you pray with me?